up. I, I, you know what I mean. We love you all tonight. It's cold and wet and rainy, but we are in the presence of God where it's warm, raining on the inside, is outside as much as it's raining on the inside, and we're thankful for that. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Let's enter into worship for who he is and what he's done. We are grateful tonight. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for who you are, for how much you love us, Lord, that you would demonstrate your great love for us, making manifest, not just in word, but in deed. Thank you for laying down your life for us. And Lord, we love you because you first loved us. Have your own way in every heart, in every life, Lord, every home that's represented. Do what you want to in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Oh, there's beauty in my brokenness. Oh, I've got true love instead of pain. Oh, there's freedom though you've captured me. Oh, and I've got joy instead of mourning. Sing that again. There's beauty in my brokenness. True love instead of pain. This freedom, though you've captured me, when I've got joy instead of mourning, when you give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, oh, down deep in my soul, when you give me joy down deep. Soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. There's beauty, there's beauty in my brokenness. Oh, and I've got true love instead of pain. Oh, it's freedom though you've captured me. And I've got joy instead of Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Oh, I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. Oh, I've never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. Oh, I've never been more free, caught in your love for me. And I've never been more secure, knowing your heart. You give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Oh, you give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul.
because of who you are, I give you praise. Oh, because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. of who you are, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my own. a precious jewel or to give up I'd be a fool you are my all in all Jesus Lamb of God worthy is your name Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. And when I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Oh, you are Lord. Jesus, worthy is your name. Can we just keep on singing that again, buddy?
some things that we have in in the Lord is that we have a close relationship with him we have a God that wants to be close to us he wants to walk with us and talk with us and tell us that we are his own and it's such an awesome thing you know one of the one of the differences between all the religions of the world and true biblical Christianity is that all of all the religions in the world, their gods are distant for the most part. They're distant. But the God of the Bible, He says, I want to be your God. <laughs> I want to talk to you. I want you to talk to me. I don't want to be intimate with you. I want to be close to you. And I want you to be close to me. We see that from the very beginning when God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. And then in Revelation chapter 22, the Bible says that God will tabernacle with men once more time. God's going to dwell in our midst. Praise the Lord. Oh, I, I'm thankful today that we can say He is my Jehovah Jireh. He's my Jehovah Nisi. He's my Jehovah Sidkenu. He's mine. Hallelujah. He's mine. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come on, can you give the Lord a hand and clap of praise for that? Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Praise the Lord. You may be seated tonight. Praise God. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, I'm thankful for that. Oh, you can take that home to the bank. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our spiritual bank. Praise God. Oh, so good to see you tonight. I knew that there, uh, there was, there was uh, many that, that texted or messaged and said they wouldn't be here. Uh, for various different reasons, Thanksgiving most of all, and family. But it's so good to see you tonight, and uh, it's so good to have uh, some visitors with us tonight. Wanda and Zabretta, is that correct? So good to have you here. And welcome. And uh, are you are you both from Michigan? She's from 15 minutes from here. Okay. She can come back from okay. 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 <laughs> I didn't say it. Your friend that Wanda, <laughs> but uh, we we're so glad that you're here. And Sister Wanda is a part of uh, Faith Worship Center in Brighton, Michigan. Uh, Pastor Asher Weber, y'all know Pastor Asher, and uh, I'm actually going to be going up to the minister uh, December third, and uh, not this Sunday, but the next Sunday I'll be up there ministering, and uh, looking forward to that. And and him, and uh, I, him and I, Pastor Asher and I, we joke around. Uh, about how uh, he says that we are the Tennessee campus of Faith Worship Center. <laughs> and I tell him that we're, he's the Michigan campus of Covenant Church. So, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> anyway, but it's so good to have Steve, one of you tonight. We're going to get right into the word tonight and. Uh, uh, but uh, before I do, though, I want to pray. I just want to mention a few things. I did mention uh, Patty Ann and Ben. Y'all know them. Uh, they're wonderful, wonderful people. They're they're a part of Covenant Church. They just happen to live in Wisconsin, and uh, they'll be moving, I think, to Illinois. But they, she asked for prayer for their daughter, who is going to be giving birth uh, soon to a baby girl, 
And so pray that there's no complications. And uh, I know there's some who are not feeling well. Libby's not been feeling well. So I want to pray for Libby as well. And other just all the needs that are in the church. So can we just pray right now? Father, we just come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. And we're so thankful, Lord, that, that Lord, you have a throne of grace for us to come before. And Lord, you said to come boldly with confidence before your throne of grace. And Lord, we lift up, Lord, Patty Ann and Ben's daughter right now. We ask you that, Lord, you would touch her and that little baby girl, that there would be no complications, Lord, with that birth. We believe you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord, for Livy and every other person, Lord, and Kelly and others who are not feeling well. We pray for healing, your healing virtue to flow throughout their bodies. In the name of Jesus, we ask that, Lord, you would continue to touch Glenn and Nancy and Jim and others who, Lord, with infirmities in their bodies. Lord, we believe you for complete restoration. And, Lord, we believe you for miracles in every way, spirit, soul, body, financially, in every way. And those that are watching, that you would touch them tonight. And, Lord, we thank you for it. And we say it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. You know, when I was teaching in Bible college for many years, we would pray uh, at the beginning of every class. And one of the things that uh, it just stuck out to me over the years, and, and I, I, it just came to my mind just a second ago, is that whenever we pray, even just the prayer that we just we prayed right there, it can sometimes we can take it not that anybody here would maybe necessarily but necessarily but sometimes we can take it as if oh we're just praying oh we're just praying but i i just want to encourage you for a child of god for us it's never oh we're just praying we're just praying no we're talking to god <laughs> and he hears us and even even a prayer for example even a prayer when we're praying over our food and maybe something, the Lord brings something to our mind and we say a prayer for somebody, even something simple like that. I tell you, God hears it and God is moving on our behalf. Hallelujah. And as John said in 1 John, he said that when we pray and we pray according to God's will, we have this confidence that we shall have what we have asked for. Oh, I'm thankful for that. And healing is in the atonement. Healing and wellness is in the atonement. So we can pray and believe that is the will of God. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, uh, turn your Bibles, if you would please, to uh, the book of Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to finish Galatians chapter 3 tonight. We're going to pick up tonight with verse 15 and go through verse 29. So we'll be coming a lot, covering a lot of verses uh, but let me mention this while you're turning there and while, while little sis getting that ready, that why we got some more of these, um, covenant church jackets and I ordered some more. And so, uh, I, there, these things are really, really nice too. Uh, I love, I'm not wearing mine tonight, but I, and the only reason is because I wear it so much, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, I really do. But, um, anyway. They're, those are back there. We'd love for you to get them. They're, they cost the, us $35, but if you don't have that, whatever the, the donation amount that you can give, uh, I just want you, we just want you to have one. And so um, if you want to do that, all right, after service. All right, um, Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, and Paul writing, he said, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only... A man's covenant, yet, but yet if, if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now, as we go through this, if you're wondering, okay, what does all this mean? We're, I'm going to explain all this. It says, verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. In other words, the promise that God gave to Abraham was not so much about a nation coming from him. That was a major part of it. But the ultimate thing was about the, the seed coming from Abraham and from that nation. That's the point he was making in verse 16. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. 
that is uh, to Abraham. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And, I'm gonna, uh, and I'll read verse 19 and we'll, and we'll pray. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Tonight I want to minister just for a few minutes teaching on this passage about the purpose of the law. Now there's more in it than just that, but the purpose of the law. Let's, have, let's pray tonight together. Father, we're just so thankful tonight for your presence here. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your people Lord, we are your people called by your name, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And Lord, we just thank you tonight. I ask, for, I ask you for the anointing of the Spirit, for clarity of thought and speech. And Lord, you're anointing upon us tonight to receive. I ask you, Lord, for revelation knowledge, even as I teach it, Lord, for myself and all of us, Lord, even those that are watching now or later online, that, Lord, you would give us revelation knowledge of your word, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everyone said amen, amen. and amen. You know, one of the main agendas of the ministry of Jesus that he transferred to the apostles and then, and then to the apostle Paul was to show that the new covenant that God gave initially to Abraham or gave the promise to Abraham of it, uh, to show that the new covenant was a different way of living, thinking, and believing than the old covenant. And let me say it again, 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 one of the main agendas of Jesus was to show people. And again, he transferred this to, to the apostles and ultimately primarily to the apostle Paul because it was Paul more than any of the other apostles that God used to really unveil the new covenant. He wrote again, if he wrote the book of Hebrews, which most likely he did, he wrote 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. That's a lot. And so God gave him a, a, a special ministry, and a major part of his ministry was to show that to show Jews and Gentiles that new covenant living is not like the old covenant living. And that was that to us, that's no big deal because we were never under the old covenant system, us Gentiles. For us, that's not a big deal, but for them, that was a huge deal, especially for Jews, a huge deal. And that always should be something that is important to us because this is, this is where the new covenant came out of. It came from the, the, the nation of Israel, from the, from the Jewish people. That's why we pray for Israel. That's why we follow God's word, which says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so it's important. But, you know, it started with Jesus, and I'll just read one verse for the, that give you an example of this. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, I'll just read it to you real quick. It was in the Sermon on the Mount that he gave at the very beginning of his ministry, and he said this to the multitudes. He said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds, that, uh, exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That, was huge. that statement, again, for us, it may not seem like, oh, well, I get it. But for them, it was a huge statement. Why? It's because the only, quote, righteousness that they knew, or I should say it this way, the highest standard that the Jewish people knew of righteousness was that of the scribes and Pharisees. The word Pharisee itself uh, well, let me ask you, class, okay? Anybody know what the word Pharisee means, literally? Anybody? Pharisee? The word Pharisee literally means to separate oneself. It's the idea of holiness and to separate oneself. They were the separatists. They were the ones that had, had from their own perspective, had separated themselves completely over to God. But as Jesus said of them, he said, they honor God with their lips, but their heart is far from God. Because they had a righteousness that was based in externals and not a righteousness that really God granted and God gave, which is by grace through faith alone. And, and so they, 
they, they would have been able to read Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, where it says, Abraham believed and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. The Pharisees would have read that. But the, what's so interesting is that the, the, the Pharisees, and I'm getting ahead of myself somewhat, but the Jews in general, when they viewed Abraham, which we'll deal with some tonight, when they looked back and viewed Abraham, they looked at Abraham as if Abraham was made righteous before God because he kept the law. That was their thinking. That was completely wrong, but that was their thinking. That Abraham was, was right in the eyes of God because Abraham kept the law. Why is that wrong? Because as Paul would write in this passage that we'll get to in just a second, the law was given 430 years later after God gave the promise to Abraham. So God gave the promise to Abraham here. 430 years later is when Moses came and God gave to Moses the law. And so... But the Old Testament, their, their, their thinking, okay, the, the Jews thinking, uh, and this was not just the Pharisees, this was uh, the Old Testament way of living, it focused primarily on externals or outwardly keeping the rules that God had made for Israel. But Jesus came along. And he said, no, no, if you want to be a part of God's kingdom, the righteousness that you must have must be way, way above the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And remember what I said, for the Jewish people in that time, that culture, that whole mindset, the highest level of righteousness they thought of was the righteousness of the Pharisees. And here comes this Jew from, from Nazareth of all places that is saying, no, no, if you want to be in the kingdom of God, if you want to be in the God's kingdom, you have to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. And no doubt that would have blown the minds of people there that were listening that day in the Sermon on the Mount. But, you know, what Jesus said, it, uh, what he was giving them, again, he was showing them that new covenant way of living, which he was introducing it, and again, God would use Paul primarily to be the one that explained more the details of it. But Jesus would say in John chapter 6 and verse 29, he would say also to the multitudes, he would say, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one whom God has sent. And so you had, you had these two opposites. You had the righteousness, which was really self-righteousness based on externals based on outward rituals and our behavior, outward behavior. You had that, so it was, and it really wasn't righteousness that came from God. It was self-righteousness. But then you had the righteousness that came from God. God gave, God gave, the only true righteousness is that which God gives, not which we earn, not which is based on externals. And so Jesus is introducing that, and again, Paul explains it even more and, and in Paul's ministry, again, it was no different at the very core. It was showing Jews and Gentiles that to be, to be in right standing with God, uh, which lays the foundation for right living with God, it's not by following simply an outward set of rules, like in the Old Testament. It's by, but it's by believing, it's by faith alone in the one whom God has given us. His son, Jesus. And I know that's simple, but you know what? That's, it, that, sim that simplicity of the gospel is what we need to, is, is really how our minds are renewed really every day. And so that's a major part of it. And one of the things, as I said earlier, one of the things the Jews believed about the law and Abraham is that Abraham was actually right with God because he kept the law. But that was, again, of course, wrong thinking. But you know, what's interesting with the Jews, why, and some might wonder, why did they think that? It's because they had, there was such an emphasis upon law. They thought law and law keeping was the means by which they entered into the kingdom of God. They felt as if law, by their, by their own being, be, they were Jews, by who they were naturally, and by what they did outwardly, they were right with God. But here comes Jesus, and again, here comes Paul eventually, and then the apostles that would come along and say, no, no, no. 
That is not how we're right with God. We are right with God by faith alone in the one whom God has sent. But you know, the Jews, they believe that about Abraham and the law because no doubt someone had said it at some point in the past and they grabbed a hold of it and they kept on repeating it. And again, what, ha- and what happened was because they kept on believing it and repeating it is they viewed it as if it was scriptural. And that same, that same thing can actually happen in some, in some ways in Christianity on an individual basis, on a collective basis, that sometimes even in the body of Christ, there are things that can be believed because someone said something in the past and it was repeated over and over and over again so much that, we just, that people just grabbed a hold of it and, and, act, and, and viewed it as if it was scriptural. But it really wasn't. But in verse 15... Paul writes again, but brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet, it, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now, what Paul is doing in this passage is, is he's showing them that the law, when God gave the law, it never changed the promise that God gave to Abraham. And again, just so that you know, the promise that God gave to Abraham, as he would explain here in this passage, but in a nutshell, the promise that God gave to Abraham was about a coming seed that would come through him that, in which, that, would, that would bring, that he would be the Messiah. He would be the Savior. That was, and, and again, Paul would write it at, at the end of verse 16, who was Christ. That was the promise that God gave to Abraham. And the point he's making is that the law didn't change anything. So he says in verse 15, the point he's making is he's saying, okay, let's look at it at a, at a, from totally a human, you and me type of perspective. In that, for a minute, he said, if, if anyone writes up a legal agreement, it is confirmed through signatures. Have you ever had to sign a legal document? I'm pretty sure all of you have. We had to sign legal documents. When, you, when we sign that legal document, that's the idea here, a legal document, when, once those signatures are signed, it is finalized. It's done. That's case closed. It's done. And Paul, would, he's using this as a natural illustration. illustration. We do that even in the, in the natural. Once those signatures are done, it's finalized. Now, in those days, as, if, as in our days, too, uh, agreements that are signed, there can later on, there can be amendments that are made that, that change, you know, the agreement or add to it or, you know, little s- details. But, but get this, even in those cases, and Paul wasn't really getting into that aspect, but even in those cases, it has to be the original signature makers that make those addendums, not somebody else. That has nothing to do with the agreement. And so the point is, is that once an agreement is signed and made, it's finalized. And that's what happened with God's promise to to Abraham. It was really, it was a covenant promise that he gave to Abraham. And Abraham didn't have to do anything to be, to, to, to put himself in agreement with that promise. All he did was simply believed. And I want you to go to Genesis chapter, keep your finger here, go to uh, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, or we'll sit if you, if you got that back there. Go to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. And oh, there's a great, powerful uh, passage. In Genesis 15 and verse 6, Genesis 15 is when God reconfirms his that covenant with, a, uh, with Abraham, Genesis 15 and verse 6. And, and it says in Genesis 15, 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. <laughs> well, it's powerful. And he believed, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. In other words, God declared Abraham righteous. Why? It's because he believed. He believed. And that in itself went completely against the whole mindset of we are right with God based on following the externals. 
And and I want to make this uh, plain and uh, and not so that nobody would misunderstand. Externals they, they can be they there can there's an important role to externals. Uh, there there is an important role. But those external even when we do the externals like for example dress modestly, or I got my money's worth for this haircut. Okay, I was going to mention it at some point. <laughs> Okay, it's external, but there's no righteousness here, okay? <laughs> With short hair or long hair, there's, nothing, no, there's no righteousness there. But uh, what was my point? Okay, uh, that was my point. There's no righteousness there. In, in verse 16, he says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And he does not say, And to seeds as of many but as of one and to your seed who is Christ. You see, God's promise to Abraham was focused on the seed coming through him, coming through Abraham, and ultimately coming through Israel, the nation. That was the focus of the promise that God gave to Abraham. Now, God gave the, now when God, it, what's very interesting, when God gave the promise to Abraham initially in Genesis chapter 12, and God comes to Abraham and while Abraham is in, is in Ur of Chaldees, uh, uh, the Chaldeans, which is um, basically Iraq and Iran, he's over there. And, and he's a Gentile. There were no Jewish people. And he comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make of you a mighty nation. I'm gonna, there's a nation that's going to come out of you that will bless the whole world. And those that bless you, I'll bless, and those that curse you, I'll curse. And then as in Genesis chapter 15, many years, or several, probably thir about 13 years later, Abraham is most likely discouraged, and God comes back to him again and says, and, and says Abraham, look, look up at the sky. Do you, can you count the number of stars in the sky? And Abraham said, no, I can't. And God says, that's the number. That, that, that's, that's what your seed is going to be. You can't count the number of people that will come from you, Abraham. And then that's in Genesis 15, 6, and Abraham believed the word of God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But get this, my point of bringing that up is that God gave to Abraham the promise about seeds, plural. That was the nation of Israel. But the main focus of the promise that God gave, Abraham, gave to Abraham was about the seed, as he mentions here in verse 16. It all had to do with the seed, the Christ that was coming, the Savior that was coming. And that in itself was important because the Jews of that day, again, they viewed the nation of Israel basically as, as the, that, that they personally, that they were the blessing of the world. Now, there's some truth in that, but, but it all has to do with Jesus. Verse 17, he says, And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And why, why is Abraham such an important figure? It's because the Jewish people, they understood that their whole nation came from Abraham. And so Abraham was an important figure, and Abraham was the main person that Paul used in his epistles, and, and also David as well, but mainly, mainly Abraham, was the main example of faith. The main example of faith. <clears throat> and again, he says in verse 17 that the law that came through Moses was 430 years later after God gave the promise to Abraham. And the point he's making, and as, as I've already said, it, that the law, the giving of the law that was 430 years later, it didn't change anything. It didn't change the promise to Abraham. It didn't cancel out the promise. It didn't annul it. It, just, it didn't do anything to necessarily to the promise. The promise was still the promise. The Messiah is coming. The seed is coming. But then God gave the law 430 years later. For what reason 
did God give the law? What was the purpose? Well, Paul goes into that beginning in verse 19 when he says, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through, through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, <clears throat> the point that he's making there in verse 19, again, as I've already said, was Paul, well, Paul, let me back up a little bit. Paul would have understood that, that based on some earlier comments that he had made about law, that we're not justified by keeping the law, but by faith alone. And he would say back in chapter 2 that nobody is justified in the eyes of God by keeping the law. He understood that people, primarily Jews, but also Gentiles, would read that and think, whoa, whoa. Well, I guess the law, if the, I guess the law must be bad. I guess there's the promise. I guess, it's, I, guess it, I guess what Paul is saying is good promise, bad law. <laughs> and my wife and I, we were just talking about this before service, about how sometimes we can hear something and then we can interpret it completely different. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? I can say, have a wonderful day. So what you're saying is... <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> So what you're saying is today's going to be terrible. No, no, I said have a great day. <laughs> but we can, you know, we can, a word can go in and we can interpret it. Paul understood that there would be some, if not many, that would interpret what he said as, as if Paul was saying good law, I'm sorry, good promise, bad law. And that was not what Paul was saying at all. So he says here, again in verse 19, what purpose then does the law serve? What's the purpose of the law? Now let me, let me stop right here just for a moment and give a little uh, insight into the law. Because the, the Old Testament law, really, there was three aspects, three main aspects of the Old Testament law. And you probably, maybe you've heard this before. If you haven't, you're hearing it now. There was the there was the sacrificial aspect of the law, Old Testament law. That was all the animal sacrifices. There were tons of them. I mean, tons of animal sacrifices. That's the sacrificial aspect. There was a ceremonial aspect of God's law. The ceremonial aspect of God's law was basically the laws that God made, for example, for priests. In order for them to become a priest, they had to go. There was a whole set of laws for a Levite to become an active priest. That, was, that fit within the ceremonial laws. Um, there were uh, 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 other aspects. Of, let me look at it real quick, uh, quickly. The, 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 the ceremonial, the, the feast days, for example, fit within those ceremonial laws. Uh, the circumcision fit within those ceremonial laws. And then there was the third aspect, which, which was the civil laws. Uh, and those were basically how we conduct our, how they conducted themselves. They were laws, for example, the, uh, like the, the moral aspect of it, but you shall not murder. But a part of the civil laws of the Old Testament was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You've heard that before? That was a part of the, 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 the civil side of the law. Laws, for example, about lepers. If you had leprosy, there were certain laws that you had to follow. You had to go outside the camp and stay a certain distance away from the camp. That was a, and then if someone committed a, a crime accidentally, they set up cities of refuge. That was all a part of the civil law. And why did they have that? Because Israel was a nation. It was a nation of people, and they needed civil laws uh, in order for them to, to function correctly. And so God set up those three main aspects of, of the law, um, and those, 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 those aspects of the law, all of it really, but primarily the moral aspect of God's law, uh, was, the perp was, was the aspect of the law that showed us that we were sinners. What purpose does the law serve in verse 19? It was added because of transgressions. The point that Paul's making is, is that the law, God added the law 
to show us, to show Israel and to show all humanity that we were sinners in need of the Savior. Again, he said here in verse 19, it was added because of transgressions. And, and the word transgression, it's a different word for sin. There's many words for sin, many words for sin in the New Testament, one of them being transgressions. The word transgression refers actually to going beyond the limit, the set limit that God has given. Basically, it means to break the law, to show that we are lawbreakers. We're all transgressors. But he uses that word added, and that's a very important word. The law was added. So here we, so here we have the promise. Let me put it this way, the horizontal. Here's the promise right here. And then the law came later. But the, the, the idea of added, it, it creates this picture of two laws basically functioning at the same time and running parallel with each other. Does that make sense? Again, you have the promise that God gave to Abraham. The promise is about the coming seed that's coming in the future. Then you, and then, so here's the promise God gave it to Abraham about the coming seed, pointing to my wife, but anyway, but coming seed. <laughs> and, and then 430 years later, God gave the law. So you have both of these agreements functioning at the same time. He said the law was added to the promise to show Israel that they were sinners. Now, there was another purpose for the law that we'll get into, it, that Paul will get into in just a minute, but it was primarily for that purpose, to show that they were sinners. And <clears throat> he says here, until the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. The point was, God gave the promise, and he gave the law to, to work together with each other until the seed came, until Christ came. And then he would say later on, we'll get it just like he would say in just a, he would say that when the seed came, we're no longer under the law anymore. And so I want to deal with that here in just a minute. But the the law again focused on externals. And, but again, it showed mankind, it showed Israel and mankind and, as a whole that they were sinners. In verse 20, it says, now the mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. That can be a confusing statement there in, view, in verse 20. But the idea is that the promise and the law both were given by God himself. And he's the one who determines the purpose of each agreement. Not Israel, not the Gentiles, not anybody else. But the one God who gave the, both the promise and the law, is, he's one. One God gave them both. And there's, there was, in other words, God didn't go through, the, through a mediator to make the promise or the law. He made it all by himself. And then in verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. And again, Paul asked that question. He was, it was very common for Paul to ask questions, and that was common in, that, in the Jewish way of thinking and talking, even writing. Uh, but he asked that question because he knew that, that some, some people would be taking what he said the wrong way about the law. So is the law then against the promises of God? For example, again, good promise, bad law. Is that the scenario? He said, certainly not, or God forbid. No, that's not, the, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what God did. He said in verse 20, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, Truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. You know, he, he said here, and it's self-explanatory in verse 21, if there was a law that, got, that could have given righteousness in life, then righteousness in life would have come by that law. But there is no law that can do that. There is no external law that can do that. He said in verse 22, But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. What's interesting about in verse 22 is that Paul says, he doesn't say 
that the law confines everyone under sin. He says scripture confines all under sin. So the law, so the, the, the point is this, is that law proves to mankind that we're lawbreakers. And I don't have, uh, I won't go through the whole thing, but I think most of you understand what I'm talking about because you can ask the question, have you ever lied? Have you ever, uh, have you ever um, uh, had covetous in your heart? Have uh, you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Well, all of us are guilty. And just right there, that's just three. All of us are guilty. And as James would write in James chapter 2, if you break one, you broke them all. So all of us are in that place. And the law, does, now the law says that. But Paul would say in verse 22, it's the, the scripture also says that. So the idea is this, is that even before the law was ever given, mankind was proven to be sinners in the eyes of God. For example, going all the way back to the book of Genesis, when Adam, when Adam and Eve fell, what was that? That was sin. And Paul would write this in, in, in Romans chapter 5, that before law was ever given, sin was still sin. But what the law did is God, God gave the law to make it very, very clear to mankind we're sinners in need of a Savior. So he goes on to say in, in verse uh, 23, but before faith came, and before faith came, that's speaking about Jesus here, before Jesus came, or the new covenant came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith, but but after faith has come, again, after Jesus has come, he said, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That, those, those words that he writes there in, in verse 23 and 25, these verses are, are powerful because before, he's making the point that before, and this is all a part of the purpose of the law. Number one, it was to show us that we were sinners. But he adds this thought to it, that God gave the law primarily to the Jewish people as a tutor to them. And the old King James uses the word schoolmaster, and tutor probably is a better word because that's really what it, what it referred to, was a, a personal tutor. In the Roman world of that day, household tutors were very common. Not every house had one, but it was very common. Per, uh, tutors in those days were primarily servants or slaves, household servant slaves, which they were not slaves like we think of slaves. Uh, a servant or slaves in, in most of the Roman world, actually they, there was a lot of advantages that they had. Uh, and so, but this, many households had personal tutors that their main responsibility was to take care of the child or the children, if they had many children, to take care of them. That was their main responsibility, take care of the children, teach the children, get the children breakfast, bring them lunch and dinner. That was, I mean, it was like a nanny, but it, uh, if you, you, you know, that is a nanny, but it went beyond just the role of a nanny. It was, it was very extensive, this tutor. And so they understood what that meant. He said, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So God gave the law, again, alongside of the promise, and God gave the law to Israel just like a tutor to bring them to Christ. Now, this is one of the, the aspects of the law, the Old Testament law, that, that a lot of times I think we miss, we don't quite, we, we, we don't miss it, or we don't get it. We think of the law, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the law was external, primarily external rituals, whether it was ceremonial, sacrificial, or civil. And then you had the moral aspect of God's law, of course, which were primarily the Ten Commandments. But we think of them primarily in those ways, like the sacrifices, you know, external things. But God gave the law to Israel to keep Israel as God's unique chosen people that were looking forward to the coming Messiah. Let me say that again. 
God gave the law to Israel to keep Israel a unique, or I should say God's, God's unique chosen people that were looking forward to the Messiah. And he gave the law for that re- and as a major part of that reason. And that was, and, and uh, by, by Israel keeping the laws that God gave them, that was them, that was the law being their tutor to bring them to Christ. To keep them in alignment. Because one of the main flaws of Israel in the Old Testament is that Israel, over and over and over again, if you read, as I know you've read the Old Testament before, if you haven't, it's a good idea to do so. But one of the things that you see over and over again with Israel is that Israel, they always wanted, whenever they went astray, normally it was in this way. We just want to be like the nations around us. You ever read that before? We just want to be like the nations around us. When, the, when, when Saul became king, it started by Israel coming to Moses and saying, we see the nations around us and they all have kings. We want a king. Now that in itself, there was nothing wrong with them wanting a king. But what was wrong was them wanting a king to be like the other nations. Does that make sense? Because God actually had a man that would eventually be their king, and that was David. A man after God's own heart. But Israel went, a, went, went about it, but went about it with the wrong motivation, with the motivation of, we just want to be like the other nations around us. And so Israel, one of their major flaws was their desire to just be like all the other nations around them. But this is the thing that God kept on bringing them back to. Israel, you are not like the other nations. You are my chosen people. You are unique. And you'll never, this is a, well, this is a huge thing for Israel, or a huge hurdle for them to get over. They had to get over the hurdle that they would never, ever, ever be like the nations around them. But God wanted them that way. And you know what? The same thing applies to you and I as the body of Christ. We, we as the body of Christ, we are not a nation like a physical nation like Israel. We don't even operate that way. We don't have a homeland that we can say, okay, that's our land. Okay, you're not, the UN, come on, give us our land. We don't do that as the body of Christ. Because our homeland is actually heaven. We're citizens of heaven. We're in the kingdom of God, which is not of this world. But Israel... They were under the dispensation of law, and this is a major part of not being under a tutor anymore. They were under the dispensation of law, but when Christ came, they were no longer under that dispensation of law. But my point is this, bringing that up, is that that God God chose Israel to be a unique people, and them keeping the law was a part of that. And it kept them being unique. It kept them putting God first. Love love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. He would tell them, don't make any idols of me. Because I'm not like the gods of the other nations around. And for us today as the body of Christ, we will never ever be like this world. If we follow Jesus like we ought to, like the Bible says, we will never ever be like the spirit of this world because we've got a different spirit living on the inside of us. It's called the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And so we will never be like the nations around. We will never be like the world. But what what do we see? And I'm not trying to be pessimistic. It's just being real. But what do we see as a major temptation and a major drawback even within the body of Christ? The same thing like Israel. We just want to be like everyone else. Where God basically says through his word in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 actually, we are a peculiar people. We're a, we're a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood. We're different. We've been called out of darkness to into the light and we've been called to proclaim and praise him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light that's who we are completely different from this world 
So he, going back to verse 24, the law, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. And so you and I, and the point he's making is that, is that we, the Jews in particular, but also the Gentiles too, we're no longer under that dispensation of law. Why? It's because Christ has come. Christ fulfilled the law. Number one, that's the main reason why we're not under law that on, under that old dispensation of law anymore. Because Christ came and He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the sacrificial system. He's given us a whole higher standard of living. Now it's not eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Now it's bless your enemies. <laughs> wow. Now it's lay down your life. Like Jesus did. He laid down his life for sinners. That was never in the law in the Old Testament. But Jesus came to bring something that was so beyond the law. And you and I have the grace of God uh, uh, and really the Holy Spirit both working on the inside of us. And now we are under the dispensation of the new covenant of grace. And he would say, in, again, in verse 25, but after the faith has come, or after Jesus has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Jesus have put on Christ. And there in verse 27, he's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about our spiritual immersion into Christ. If he was talking about water baptism, actually, it would be totally against what he just said. <laughs> But he's talking about a spirit, our spiritual immersion into Christ. And in verse 28, and Sam, you can come back. Uh, in verse 28, one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Mm, well, that's powerful. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, we have, we, we have to understand this. Understand this. This, went, this went so against the thinking of the Jewish people of that day. Even the Gentile people, it went against their thinking. Because the Gentiles of that day, which were primarily Roman and Greek, okay, Romans primarily, their mindset was, we're Romans. We're the best. <laughs> if you really want to be somebody, be a Roman. Be like a Roman. Become a Roman citizen. That was their mindset. The Jews, their mindset was, no, no, if you really want to be somebody, you got to be a Jew. <laughs> so both Jew and Gentile, they had that going on. And you know what? It's, hum- it's, it's, our, it's our own, within our own fleshly nature, even today in 2023, mankind still has that bent. We create groups. It can be nationalistic. It can, be, it can be cultural, it can be racial, skin color. We can do so many things. Oh, if you really want, if you, oh, I know it's grace and faith, but if you really want, if you really want to be right with God, then you have to be like us. That's just human nature. But Paul says, no, that's not the new covenant. That's not why Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross to give us this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, in Christ, there's no class system. Oh, and praise God for that. And he would say, finally, in verse 29, for if, and, if you are, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed. you got to believe on Jesus and you're Abraham's seed. It has nothing to do with what nation you were born in. It has nothing to do with skin color, nas- nationality, culture. It has nothing to do with that at all. It has to do with faith alone. Will you stand to your feet tonight? Thank you, Lord. Let's pray tonight. Father, we are so thankful tonight for the promise that you've given us, the great promise that you've given us, that, Lord, we are righteous with you by faith alone. And, Lord, we thank you that you are working on the inside. Lord, you're on the inside working on us. And, Lord, that manifests itself on the outside. And, Lord, we just give you praise and glory tonight that we are all one in Christ Jesus. 
and we give you thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, an amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. thankful tonight for the cross there is he breaks down all the barriers and I'm thankful for that praise the Lord we're not living under that under the law anymore we're living under grace I'm gonna ask brother Ronnie if he can close us in prayer tonight Heavenly Father we once again thank you Lord for this opportunity to come tonight Lord Father, we thank you, Lord, for the hearing of your word, and we pray that, Lord, that you help us to apply it to our hearts and in our lives each and every day, as we carefully give you all the praise, honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, God bless you all, and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And uh, we're still going to be having prayer meetings Saturday at 10 a.m., if you're able to come, and then we'll, or otherwise we'll see you Sunday at 1030.